one. I'm now delighted to be joined by Wayne McCullough, the, the one and only the Irish sensation, the pocket rocket, WBC bantamweight uh, champion from 1995 to 1997, Olympic silver medalist in 1992 in Barcelona. And I suppose, uh, Wayne, we set you a task um, this week. Uh, it's a sort of difficult task as well. We've talked about boxing fights in relation to the last decade or two that have left their significance on you in terms of their importance and then their, in terms of their spectacle. We all know some heavyweight uh, classic fights that probably haven't lived up to the uh, perception or their billing and then we all know sort of fights that have been absolute ding-dongers where no one has expected them to be such instant classics and uh, they certainly left their mark or transcended the boxing world. So we've asked you in terms of your own uh, per, per stake, you've been around the boxing game for uh, decades in relation to at the highest level. And uh, what fights have stood out or what fights have made you uh, uh, edge at the top of your seat in terms of being a, not only a boxing a person, but a boxing lover as well. So, um, Wayne, we'll get things uh, rolling. Uh, we'll get things started. And uh, we'll start our countdown at, at number 10. And in terms of uh, the fight that has probably, in terms of getting off the starters, uh, your fascination in the last decade or two with boxing, what takes the number 10 spot? You know, it's like, when you go back, to, I have a little route down my phone, by the way. Yeah. Um, about boxing, you know, I love to go back to history. You know, you've got the last 20 years or so, I, one of my, one stands out is Mickey Ward at Turgetti. You know, the first fight, when, get, when Ward, Ward beat Getty the first time, but he hit him with a body shed that would make any, any man quit. And then, um, a tour Getty hit the canvas, but 99% of the people who get hit with that left hook, their body are not getting up. And Mickey Ward had a devastating left hook. But a tour Getty get up, because he's not one he's not he's at one percent who would always get up. And of course, Mickey Ward won that fight. It was in, it was 18th of May 02. And um Mickey Ward won that fight. Getty won the second fight, another great fight, and then the third fight was all was all Getty. Later Tour Getty, who was a legend. But um so that was a great trilogy and fantastic. Both guys took probably took 10 years off each other's life <laughs> in the first two fights. But I say the last fight was mostly all, all Getty because War was that sort of a little bit dumb. But he still stood there, he still stood there and, and fought toe to toe for the final bail. But I like, I love fighters like that. Two Getty, Mickey War were, you know, not, their defense wasn't the greatest, but they'll give everything they have. And they, they stood, I'd say, they stand toe to toe, body shots, head shots, blood, guts. They went at it for well around three times. <laughs> and I suppose in terms of that fight, um, Mickey Ward and Joe Getty, the opening rounds of the style was a very cagey. We know in some sort of but fights, people start to feel each other out for the first round or two. They start to start to get to grips in terms of a boxer style, maybe start who takes the center of the ring, who started jabbing, sort of was this sort of Guns blazing for the first few rounds. Both guys going, trying out, throwing big haymakers, trying to knock each other out. Was it fast and furious from the off go win? Yes, these guys. These guys were trying to lift each other's head off. You know, they were, the first fight wasn't on like it wasn't big money, small money. You know, they didn't get that much money. Nobody expected there was going to be a trilogy, but they took lumps out of each other. There was blood everywhere. They probably broken noses, busted ribs, everything. They just traded for, for 12 rounds and say the tour got to get hit that left hook the body and, and go down or get back up. And the first two fights, the first two fights were like that. You know, they just, they just took years of each other's life, I think. And as I say, their defense wasn't the greatest, but they, you know, they made up for it in just a non-stop punching going forward. You know, one guy's hurt, the other guy's hurt. It was like a, it was like a real, it was actually like a, a Rocky movie, but it was actually real. Hmm. You know, we all know the Rocky movies is all, all acting, but this, this, these guys weren't acting, believe me. These guys were, you know, these guys deserved a million dollars per round. I you know, you talk about that, so when you talk about some, like, fighters getting $50 million or 100 hmm. these two guys deserve $1 million per round. Yeah. And they never got anything they got, you know what I mean? I suppose, Wayne, that takes your number 10 spot, Mickey Ward versus Arturo Gatti. We're going to move up the ladder now in terms of number nine. And uh, what takes this position for you? Well, to say, my, these ones are not in the last 20 years. These are ones yeah. in the history of the box. Perfect. But I, I have to go back to, I was a kid in Belfast, in 11th of February, 1990, when Buster Douglas upset the world. Mm. 
I mean, not to Mike Tyson, but that fight, if you watch that fight, I'm a Mike Tyson fan. I love Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson dropped Buster Douglas. And believe me, it's a long count. It was a long 10 round, 10, was like the referee counts the eight, and then he gets you fight again. It seemed to be like 15 seconds. If you go back and watch the knockdown when Buster Douglas get dropped, you'll have, you maybe count about 10 or 15, or sorry, you've counted about 12 to 15. But you got to give Buster Douglas the credit for getting back up again. And when he got back up, he dominated and Mike Tyson. We all find out later on he wasn't even training, hmm. you know, in, in Japan. He wasn't even training or doing anything. But I think that was one of the, the biggest upsets in the boxing history. And it was a good fight too. Because, hmm. see, you know, when Tyson was getting hurt, you, you get knocked down. And you remember he bent over for his mouthpiece trying to get it in. He wasted more time. when He, he was already done, but he, but he was trying to get his mouthpiece when he didn't really need it. He just had to stand up straight. And... He didn't get back up again, so that was um that was the end of sort of Mike Tyson career. And um, Buster Douglas had a quick career, lost to Holyfield, and then that was it. But he got the money, he got the payday. <laughs> I suppose we uh, you would talk about Buster Douglas, you talk about Mike Tyson uh, in their prime, real two heavy hitters and real two guys with an awful lot of power behind that definitely behind that right hand. And uh, in terms of uh, in terms of trading blows, uh, we normally see with those heavyweight fights, um, the like longevity of getting a 10, maybe 12 round is very rare. And I suppose people would have been perceiving that maybe these two Titans going at it, that someone's going to be KO'd fairly early on. I'm, I was, I'm a Mike Tyson fan, you know what I mean? I love Mike Tyson. You know, um, he was... The greatest youngest heavyweight of all time. He could have been, could have been the best of all time, but he, you know, it's important. You read, you know, he, what he did. He didn't train properly after that. And when Customato had passed away, that was more or less the end of him. But you know what? Mike Tyson was, in, was I thought he was invincible. Mm. You know, when he, he fought, I say Buster Douglas got to get the credit for that that win that night. Of course, we all know what Tyson was even training. He was doing this, doing that. But it's a win over a guy that's invincible. Who was supposed to not get not lose that fight. The odds were stacked against, you know, Buster Douglas winning that fight. But history, you know, that's why there's boxing has so much history. When things like this happen, you know, it just makes people watch even more. Okay, so Wayne, we've had your number ten, Mickey Ward versus Arturo Gatti. We have your number nine, uh, Buster Douglas versus Mike Tyson, and. Uh, we're moving up now. We move up to number eight, and uh, in terms of the eight spot, which what takes this for you? Well, it, the real truth is, I, I really don't have these in order. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, I don't really have them in complete order, but you can put them. In, you can put them in your order if you want. <laughs> you know, the modern day, of course, is one fight that I I was at. Yeah, it's Diego Corrales, Jose Luis Castillo one, and May May seven four five, and then um, it was actually. My wedding anniversary, <laughs> and I'm at the fight, and um, Corrales was was dominating the fight round after round. Corrales was so um, so tall for the weight class; he was like six foot tall. He, he was 130 champion, 130 up to 35, 140. But Diego was he could punch, long skinny guy, but he could punch. And um, Corrales was a great great puncher, but um, Castillo he could punch as well. But I remember the. The tenth round is probably one of the best rounds in boxing history. Um, left hook lands for Castillo. Carlos hits the canvas, but he's smart enough back then. He pulled out his mouthpiece, which you're not allowed to do today. They changed the rules. Mm. When he pulled it out, he gave him more time to go back to the corner, get up. You know, I give him an extra ten seconds. Walks out again, bump left hook, drops him again. <laughs> he's on the canvas again for the second time in the tenth round. And I was in the media section. Remember that? And all the Mexican media guys stood up. And Corrales rose up, he rose up, and the referee said, box, they thought it was over. And I said to them, you better sit down again, it's not over yet. So Corrales walks out, hits Castillo, gets him against the ropes. Castillo was out on his feet, referee steps in, because Corrales wins the fight. One of the, one of the best, it's the best fight, it's the best fight I've ever sat down watching live. And I'm sitting there, I was actually there, part of it. And the 10th round alone was just, Unbelievable, but I was, I was there for that fight, and the arena was shocked, hmm. just like Buster Douglas knocking out, out Mike Tyson. The arena was shocked because it was a one way street, and then all of a sudden, boom, Corrales gets that win. But he always had that knockout punch, and he was hurt, 
badly twice, pull at the mouthpiece, came out in this in this corner, Joe or um Goosen was in the corner, Joe Goosen. He, he remember if you look at that fight in the corner he says, We better quit knock this mother ever out. <laughs> and he went out and knocked him out. He knocked him out and you know what? Another bit of history. And I suppose, Wayne, in terms of those Latino sort of fighters that we all know, the likes of Eric Morales, Barrera, the classic sort of fights, this sort of, the, the, the warrior sort of attitude, and especially that's, part, we can put the same remarks towards uh, Castillo and uh, Corrales, that sort of warrior sort of mentality that uh, uh, be killed or do the killing as the same goes. They, they leave everything out on, on the feet, everything out on the sort of the canvas, and uh, in terms of the, the sort of punishment they take, but in terms of the punishment that they're able to deliver as well, once they get into the real throngs of it, it's all hell for leather, isn't it? Yeah, well, I think the Hispanic fighters and the Irish fighters are pretty similar, to tell you the truth, because then, um, you know, we'll fight to the end, we'll dig deep, and we may not have the best skills, you know, but we'll get in there and fight, and we'll, we'll give it, our hearts big. Hispanic fighters have big heart, and um I say the Irish fighters would be similar to them. They would just give it 100%. No matter win, lose, or draw, we'll go out there and the Hispanic fighters do that. They're tough. I fought, I fought a dozen or two of them. You know, I fought Morales and stuff. So I know what it's like. They'll, they'll dig deep. We'll dig deep. And um, that's what makes boxing so so great to watch. When you get fights like that with guys, you're not going to give up. Like a tour guy to make it work. They're never going to give up. And um, that's what makes a great fight. I suppose Diego Corrales, he was a legend in terms of his boxing ability and in terms of uh, he, he, in terms of the way he dominated sort of fights. But in terms of the modern sort of generation now with your Canelo Alvarez and all that, how does um, Diego Corrales, how would he compare if he was boxing today? Would he be uh, on that sort of category? Oh, Corrales, he fought Mayweather and, he, and I remember him fighting Mayweather. Mayweather was young and just getting started off and, and Corrales was murdered making the weight. I remember it. That I was at that fight too, and I think Mayweather dropped him three or four times. But he he was so exhausted trying to make. I think they fought at one thirty five or thirty one thirty thirty five, like not nine a super featherweight um lightweight. But I remember he was murdered making the weight, and then he was so um exhausted, and and he still put on a good fight, and and um he still he still dug deep. Although he was probably energy was totally gone, but the cross is a hell of a fighter. I say I'll never forget. He was killed on his motorcycle. You know, I got a call from my friend Kevin Kelly, and I was actually, it was my anniversary. I was in California. He died, he killed around the corner from me in Vegas, about a half mile. And as I say, he beat, he beat Castillo on May 7th, and he died, he died in, he died in May 7th, 07 as well. So that's my anniversary. I'm never going to forget that. He beat, Cast, beat Castillo on my anniversary, and then he, he just killed on my anniversary. So. You know, great guy. I knew, I knew him as well. I knew him as well. A great guy to talk to. And um, it's sad that it happened in the end. The motorcycle accident was really sad because he was such a good person and a hell of a fighter. You know what I mean? I suppose, Wayne, we'll continue up along the order. Number 10, so we had Mickey Ward versus Arturo Gatti. Number 9, Buster Douglas uh, against Mike Tyson. Number 8, Diego Corrales and Joyce Luis Castillo. Uh, in, in terms of the number 7 spot, uh, We'll just start to move up, and uh, as you said, there's no particular order, but we just. Order. Yeah. But I, go, I say I, go, I get, I get the history here, and that's why I love the history of it. You say, um, my first fight I was at in Vegas, um, in '93 when I came here was, Riddick really Bow versus Holyfield. No, I was the sixth of November, 1983. That's the night when the fat man. Yeah. Flipped. Remember the guy I can it was freezing cold out, and I remember sitting in the stand, and then all of a sudden this guy flies in, and the fight was um, the fight was close. I think that changed the whole pattern because Riddick Bo beat Holyfield two out of three fights. People forget about that. Riddick yeah. Bo was trained by my by my coach Eddie Fudge, but Riddick just went off the rails after that, and he sort of didn't train properly. But he he beat Holyfield twice, and that 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 fight here, that one here, they could have won that one as well. But I think the fan man changed a little bit of history there. Where Bo, you know, the fight continued. They were they were cold and had to get warmed up again, and a great fight too. But I was there, my first live fight in America. I just came to Vegas. I'm sitting there with my my wife and thinking, this is awesome. And sitting in Caesar's Palace outdoor arena, where the where place a place where legends had fought. Yeah. And for me to be there and witness that and say the great, I'm a, I was a 
you know, it, it was in training camps with Riddick Bowe a lot of times. And I say, I loved Holyfield the way he fought too. So it was a great, two great guys. Um, I say they fought, a, they fought a trilogy and Bowe won two of, the, two of the three. But that was another bit of history there. And I suppose you mentioned uh, Riddick Bowe and he's very much the forgotten type of fighter when you think about how uh, people say Holyfield, they say Tyson, they say Lewis, they say Foreman before it. Um, so Riddick Bowe seems to get lost in that in the 90s but he had an awful lot of achievements as well and when you look at Riddick's sort of stature you start to start to forget that Riddick won an awful lot of big fights but he seems sort of lost in terms of that area because of the powerful names that he was beside and uh, he certainly achieved yeah, he, a lot. He was an Olympic silver medals 88 and, um, and then Eddie Fudge took him under the wing and, and he was I say in training camp I was in training camp a few times with him and Eddie Fudge my coach always said that Riddick Bowe could have been the greatest heavyweight of all time. Mm. When you say could have, but his problem was he was, he, he didn't like to train. Mm. You know, Eddie had to bring him to training camp like a month before he started training camp to get him in shape for training camp. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because he, he liked to eat. You know, he didn't like to, I ran with him, I ran with him in training camp and I had to turn around and go back and say, <laughs> it was like slow motion to me and I'm like, this is nuts. You're not going to break sweat doing this here and you, you got to push yourself. But a great guy, he was a great, he's pretty cool, was a great person, but he never, he never really got the credit for what he did, say he beat Holyfield's wife, but he, mm-hmm. and say, he just, he just sort of depreciated pretty quickly, mm-hmm. and um, made, made, made good money, you know, had a good manager, Rock Newman, but he could have been, he's one of these guys who looks back and say he could have been better, had he done this and done this, but he didn't, he, he didn't make the sacrifices at the time, and, um, but he's still one of the, he's, he's still one of the, the great heavyweights of, of the modern era. Definitely. Yeah. And you mentioned, uh, we said Riddick Bowe and Evander Holyfield. And I suppose for Holyfield, getting beaten twice uh, by Riddick in terms of his own sort of legacy, we all know what he achieved in, in terms of Tyson. It was very important for Holyfield as well to leave that sort of scalp, uh, not uh, that sort of remark that no one can sort of say that he 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 left any stone unturned, so he kept coming back. He sort of kept hunting Riddick down to to make amends. Yeah, I think that that era was good. You know, you had Riddick Ball, Holyfield, Lennox Lewis. Everybody forgets about Lennox Lewis. Lennox Lewis is probably one of the best British fighter of all time. You know what I mean? He was just you know he beat he beat Holyfield, Tyson, on guys. He beat them all. He and he hmm. never fought Ball, but it would have been great. But the guy was he was great. He was running that era. It was a good. Good era of, of, of boxing, you know Mike Tyson there too. It was it was today. It's, it's you've got you've got Fury and and um, Wilder and you know there's not really much else out there. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, the, the division isn't like even if you go back to Ali, you know Frazier, Norton, George Foreman. You know at that time to fight each other. There's no the, the heavyweight division who everybody loved. It's not the same as it was, and and I'm not saying the fighters can't fight; they can't fight, but they're they're taller guys, lankier guys, and and they're and they don't have the technique that these guys have. I you know, I know Tyson Fury had a guy spar him in training camp about a year and a half ago. You know, I got to meet him for the first time. He was humble to me, nice guy. So I'm not going to disrespect him. I mean, Tyson Fury can fight, as he showed in the rematch with Wilder. Wilder needs to needs to learn how to. You'll throw a jab and one two at least. You know what I mean? You can't knock everybody out. There's there's certain people you're not going to knock out, and you let, that's why you got to learn the basics of jabbing one two, roll slip blocks. But as I say, the era today, the heavyweights got to say it, it's not as good as it was. Kind of, you know, Tyson, the Holy Holyfield, Bow, you know, Lewis. That was a good. When you have four guys in the division, you know, they could fight each other. One could beat this guy, he could beat that guy. Different styles make different fights. And because you beat that guy, doesn't mean you're going to beat that guy. And that's the unfortunate part of the division right now. Hopefully, hopefully, you know, we'll come through. We'll get some guys coming through, some heavyweights. So there's a lot of big guys out there, but they're not, they're not going to box. They're going to something else. <laughs> Football or basketball over here. <laughs> I suppose we, we'll, we'll continue working down. So at 10, we Mickey Ward versus Arturo Gatti. Number nine, Buster Douglas versus Mike Tyson. Number eight was Diego Corrales versus Joe Luis Castillo. Number seven, Riddick Bowe versus Evander Holyfield. Uh, we're moving up just outside the top five now and at uh, number six. 
Well, I think this one, it's one of the best fights, the best three rounds I've ever seen live. I was watching it on TV back from back home. I was only a kid, um, 1985. It was um, Marvin Hagler versus Tommy Hearns. You got to remember that one. Yeah. Three rounds is probably three rounds is probably the best boxing you've ever seen. Fighting toe to toe, bang. You know, Hagler could fight southpaw. Hearns was like six over six foot tall. He could crack with either hand. But as I say, it was stopped in the third round. Hagler won won the fight by knockout in the third round. But the official scorecards, it was 2018-2018 for Hagler and 2018 for Tommy Hearns. He was actually up in, he was actually up in one of the cards as well, which shows what type of fight it was. And the judges were two rounds to one guy. That's the way the rounds were. The first two rounds were pretty close. And one, two judges gave it to Hagler and one judge gave it to Hearns. So it was, but that third round, the three rounds is unbelievable. But the third round alone was just, Hagler could fight. Hagler could fight. He could sort of he could crack. He wasn't a big, big, tall guy, like five and nine, ten. But he, he was, he loved to fight, come forward, bang in, left hooks, right hooks. And that fight, just, anybody's got to watch that fight. I always say to people, you love boxing? See the best three, three round in boxing, watch that. One of the best fights, Carl's Castillo. That's what I say to people. So, and I was a kid when I seen this. It was, it was, it was like, what, 85? I was like, just not even turned 15 yet. <laughs> I suppose, Wayne, we all see when legends meet and uh, they're sort of perceived fights and we all sometimes those fights go begging, they're sort of, they never sort of happen, they sort of, but these were two big heavyweights uh, that everyone, uh, in terms of their division, that everyone wanted to see fight and uh, when it did sort of happen, I suppose, people were probably tentative in terms of predictions, people were saying, oh, it could go this way, this person could win it, that could be, there was that air of unspectability un un about it that no one knew for, for sure, but everyone respected both of them. And uh, in the terms of uh, the way it worked out, it sort of felt that after the first yeah. round that we could be here all night and it could really go to score. Yeah. But that, that just goes to show you what boxing is like. Well, that's, that's what boxing, you're right. Boxing's all about the respect. You know, anybody who steps through the ropes, you know, you got to give them respect, and I I hate it when when certain commentators and stuff when a guy's fighting say the guy's scared he's run away. Well, he's he's not run away because he's in the ring because he can really where's he going to run? There's no door in the ring. He's going to have to stay in that ring. But he's not, he's trying to stay, avoid getting hit as much as he should. But he has no fear. But the, some of these commentators would say, "Oh, he's scared and he can't fight." I'm thinking, have you stepped in the ring and to face another man? as a journalist mm. and, and you, another one coming towards you to rip your head off you're going to be scared boxers are not scared we get in there and do what we do because we love it and because you know what we, some guys make one of fight thinking I'm the opponent but they're still going to have to go out there and give it a, a performance otherwise we'll get demolished so they have to go out there and, and at least try but I just don't like when people criticise like journalists and you know what I've been a journalist I've wrote my own autobiography so if they say to me, well, you just have to try my, my, I did yours. I know how to be a journalist and I know how to be a fighter. So they can't question, oh, you got to do, you can't do our job. I can't do your job. I wrote for Ring Magazine, I wrote for Sky Sports, and I did my own autobiography. So I can do your job. So you do, you try, if you're going to criticize my job, do my job. Uh, we just one fight. Yeah. <laughs> Wayne, Wayne, so we count back. So 10, we have Mickey Ward versus Arturo Gatti. 9, Buster Douglas versus Mike Tyson. Number 8, Diego Corrales versus Joey Lewis Castillo. Number 7, Riddick Bowe versus Evander Holyfield. Number 6, Marvin Hagler versus Tommy Hearns. And we're into the fifth spot now. Just decide which one I'll put in there. I think you have to give Mike Tyson. I love Mike Tyson. He, his first world championship when he when he beat Trevor Burbank, you know he, he demolished him quickly. Um, Mike Tyson's invincible. Say then he was invincible. He's knocking people out. And Trevor Burbank, remember, tried to get to his feet and he couldn't get up. His legs just gave in. He stood up, fell down, stood up, fell down, stood up, fell down. And Mike Tyson was the youngest heavyweight champion of all time, heavyweight champion. So that was Tyson as an invincible guy. He could just knock you out with either hand. You know, he's just. Aaron Mike Tyson was a good name for him because I, I say up until he lost, I thought he was made of Aaron. I was a young kid thinking, this guy is unbelievable. He just comes out and fights. He's a small guy and he's bummed. He's not that tall. He's about 
about five, he's listed at like five, ten, eleven. He's about five, eight, believe me. I've stood beside him. His neck's is about 20 inches. But Mike Tyson, he demolished Trevor Burby just completely in no time and um, became the youngest heavyweight champion of all time. I and suppose- that just shows you like. I suppose that knockout of Burbick is uh, famous in many ways because we can see the eyes are gone in the head, but the legs are still there. He's practically unconscious on his sort of feet. It, it's a sort of a scary <laughs> sort of uh, sort of a scene in terms of that you can see that it's totally lights out. What the body's delayed reaction yes, in terms my, of him falling. Mine was trying to get up. Yes, mine was trying to get up, but the old legs were like the legs won't cooperate with here. <laughs> So the, the mind was saying, get up, but the legs were like, I'm staying down. <laughs> and it was funny because it was like, he, it's funny, it's not funny because it's a, it's a tough job, mm. but him trying to get up, he was so frustrated trying to get up, he couldn't get up, he was up, he's down, he's up, he's down, he's up, he's down. And he was so frustrated with himself because he, want, he wanted to get up, but he, his legs just said, not tonight. <laughs> and Mike Tyson was just... Spectacular, Mike Tyson. You know, he was, he was brilliant. He was, you know, to be a young guy like that, he could just short guy. He weighed like today he could be a cruiserweight because up two hundred pounds is a cruiserweight. He weighed like two fifteen. He could drop down to two hundred easily. But heavyweight division, we loved when there's great heavyweights about that that division. And um, Tyson was one of the one of the greatest heavyweights of all time because he was the youngest. Not he's not the he's not the greatest. Of course, we all know that. Mm. But um, he's up there. He's up there. And in terms Exciting. of Mike, in terms of Mike's knockout power, it's sort of similar. It's scary in terms of it reminds you of Smoke and Joe Frazier in terms of that real sort of KO sort of knockout power. And uh, Mike was sort of uh, daily. The longer you could go with Mike, if you could get past the fourth or fifth round, the better sort of chance you have of probably like Deontay Wilder. If you can get past the early rounds, the sort of better chance you have. Yeah, you're right. And you talk about Joe Frazier. That was that was my next fighter. I'm going to talk about. <laughs> you know, so we're going to the next one. No, Joe Frazier was trained by my coach Eddie Fudge as well. And when Joe Frazier and Ali fought their first fight, people forget they were both young guys and they were both undefeated. Mm. And Joe Frazier beat him. He dropped him with the, the signature left hook later on. That was 15 rounds. He dropped him with the left hook, and Al, and Joe Frazier won. The first fight when they were both young, undefeated guys, and um, I don't think you ever got the credit for that because Ali was a legend and probably the greatest of all time. We got the Cassius Clay Zero, but um, Frazier never got the, really got the credit. I don't think for that because if you're young, undefeated, hungry guys and and you beat the man who's nine known as the best of all time, mm. what a win that is! You know what I mean? What a win! And um, of course, we all know Ali went on to beat Frazier twice. And the famous fight at the end where he gets stopped by my coach. But um, we all know that the great trilogy, but but just like Mickey Ward won the first fight with the Getty, you know, Joe Frazier won the first fight with Muhammad Ali. Yeah, I suppose uh, it, Joe Frazier, um, I, I suppose legacy and legends in terms of boxing, uh, he, he'll always be remembered, an iconic sort of figure. But <laughs> Joe was that sort of heavy hitter and Joe was a guy who had real power going into the 10th, 11th, 12th. The power never sort of yeah. eased out, Joe. That KO punch could come at any time, not only in the first left, few rounds. His left hook was devastating. He knew how to, you know, the dip, dip like that, the cross guard, the defense like that, where it's hard to, to peak boot style. It's, I was taught that too. But he had that left hook which just came out of the blue and bump. If your hands are down, if you're fighting against bump, that left hook's going to just land clean. On your chin, and Joe was like that. Joe, as I say, he never got the credit for that win. Ali became the greatest of all time, but Frazier just never got that credit. Because if you're two young, hungry guys undefeated, what a win that is! I mean, what a win! And um, as I say, Ali beat him twice after that, and and um, avenged a lot. Avenged it took the loss twice. I suppose, Wayne, we'll, we'll, we've got your number four now in Joe Frazier versus Muhammad Ali, the, the first fight. Um, so we'll, we'll move on to the top three, and uh, we're at a third spot now. Muhammad Ali versus George Foreman. You Rumble know. in the jungle? Yeah, for, for, yeah, Rumble in the jungle. 
Foreman, you got to remember this, Foreman. You know, Frazier and Norton, Ken Norton, who was trained by my coach yet as well, they both beat Muhammad Ali. Ali avenged the losses. Leon Spinks beat Ali, he avenged that loss. Mm. But Foreman was an undefeated guy when he fought Ali, and he, he, he beat he beat Frazier and, and Norton as well. Mm. He had knocked them out. So he's getting with the guy. Ali avenged the losses with Frazier and Norton, of course, before he fought him. But he's fighting the guy that, that he knocked. He knocked two guys that beat Ali. He's, he, or Foreman knocked them out. So it sounds like, who's going to win this fight? George Foreman. You know, but we all know the, the history of that. Ali, phew. He made George, George was a big man. He made, he made George Foreman look like a rag doll. He just sort of, you know, he just, he hit him with these combinations. He was so, Ali was so light on his feet, moving around, bam, 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 knocks him down. What a, whoa, it was unbelievable. It was just, he just made a big guy look like a, it was like Muhammad Ali fighting me. Like he made him look like a small guy when George Foreman was much bigger than him. Big boy, and he just demolished him. Ali just, it showed you how great Ali was when he, he lost to Norton, lost to Frazier, and avenged them losses, and then he fought George Foreman, who beats, who beat Norton and Frazier, undefeated guy at that time, and then he takes his unbeaten record away from him and beating George Foreman. And I think that's why Ali was on to become the greatest of all time because he, he avenged Norton, Frazier, and Spinks, three guys that beat him. His last two losses, of course, were at the, the end of his career when Larry Holmes and Trevor Burbick beat him, but that was, he already made his legacy by fighting the trilogy with. With Frazier and the, you know, and Foreman, and he fought um, Leon Spinks and beat him back. That makes a great champion when you, you go and return the favor and, and beat him not once but twice. <laughs> I suppose, Wayne, uh, in terms of uh, George Foreman, I, I, I've interviewed him in the past and I spoke to George. And one thing he said to me uh, in terms of that Ali fight, he said he hit him with the same sort of KO sort of fists that would have decked most men uh, in previous fights. And he felt sure when he threw half of them, when it connected that it was just a case of, well, I've hit him with my best, he's not going down. And in terms of Ali, that, that night, he was just in terms of, <laughs> he was unknockable really in terms of George threw everything he had. And he, as you said, he tired dramatically. Ali wore him out. The rumble, the rumble in the jungle. <laughs> um, but Ali had a good knack of um, switching things up. When he fought Frazier the second time and Norton, he, he switched things up because Frazier's game plan, Norton's game plan was great game plans, you know, and they won the fights. But then their game plan and their rematches didn't work. So Ali had already switched up his game plan. And that's how he beat them guys. And with George Foreman, he probably looked at, he, he probably studied George Foreman beating, beating um, Norton and, and Frazier and thinking, these guys beat me, he did this. I'm going to see what he does right and what he does wrong. And a good coach does that, where a good coach will watch the strengths and the weakness of your opponent and give you a plan A, plan B, and a plan C. After plan C, you're in trouble. But I think um, Ali had that knack of switching, just like Floyd Mayweather. You know, he's got that, that brain to turn things around. Because when, when Mayweather fought Jose Luis Castillo the first fight, a lot of people thought Castillo won the first fight. Second fight, Castillo was was beaten easily by, by Mayweather. So Mayweather switched up that as well. So good good fighters can switch things up. And um and then when they win the guy who'd already beat them, they avenge it and they beat him easier than he beat him the first time. So that's what makes a great fighter. And I always said if I ever fought if I ever fought somebody in the amateurs or pros that I already beat, I train even harder for the set of the rematch because I always think He's going to train harder to try to beat me this time. Yeah. So when the amateur, I fought a guy, I remember I fought some Ugandan guy again three times in different competitions, Olympics twice, World Championships. And every time I fought him, I, I beat him easier because I knew he was coming for my skill. Mm. So if I take, oh, I beat him the last time, I don't need to train hard. No, I, I made him sure next time I beat him even easier. And some guys think, oh, I beat him the first time. I could see he's the second time. And all of a sudden, boom. I'm not saying Joe Frazier and Norton didn't train, but hard it's just Ali had that little bit of a switch here where he could just turn it on and Angelo Dundee is coach with a great coach Eddie Fudge yeah. my coach in the corner as well but um, two great coaches you know two great fighters as well in, in, the, in there as well so 
Big George is a great fighter. He went on to fight, won the heavyweight championship again 20 years after he won it. 25, then 45, he wins the heavyweight championship of the world. Fantastic. George is brilliant. <laughs> he, was a, he was an old school fighter. No, yeah. George was an old school fighter and a modern day fighter. Mm-hmm. You know, he was fighting when I was still fighting in the night. So he, he was an old school and modern heavyweight champ in both both herbs. <laughs> I suppose we we've had uh, we've just recapped so number five Mike Tyson versus Trevor Verbeek number four four Joe Fraser versus Muhammad Ali the first fight and uh, number three are we on the last one number three we're at number two at number two I've so we I forget them all did that did I do cross Castillo I did that I did oh that's right Sugar Ray Rams versus Jake Lamada now that the first one. Second one, third one, fourth one, fifth. They fought six times. So at number two, we have Sugar Ray Robinson versus Jake Lamata. Yeah, the Valentine's the Day Massacre. Yeah. 1951. They fought six times. Ray, Ray but won five, but, but um, the Raging Bull won one of them. But he never took him down. It was the whole saying. Even at the massacre, poof. He was stopped in that fight, but he was never took to the floor. Just like I can say, I never hit the canvas my whole career. Mm. And um, that night, Robert, or sorry, the Raging Bull, Jake Lamata, never get took the floor, but it was a, they called the Valentine's Massacre because there was blood everywhere. Mm. And it was a war for, um, you know, Jake Lamata was just tough. And he's, you know, he, he died when he was like 90 something years old, 96 years old. He, was, he lived a big long age, and people thought a type of fighter like that who takes a lot of shots like that and is going to be dead early. He, he outlived Sugar Ray Robinson. He was. And Sugar Ray is one of the best top three of all time. You know what I mean? You could put him number one if you want to, number two, number three, you could be up there. But that was a, a bloody mess. You know, it was a, a, that's why they called Valentine's Day ma- Massacre. And these guys fought. I remember one of the fights, they fought like within 13 days of, of one fight, then 13 days later, they fight each other on a championship fight. Who does that? Mm-hmm. You know, imagine, can you imagine Mayweather fighting? Somebody was speaking in two weeks later, you're going to fight somebody else. And a title fight. That's why these guys had over 100 fights. I mean, Sugar Ray Robinson had like 200 fights. 200. You know, that's, that's amazing compared to the, the modern day to the day. It's all about, oh, we have to have television to the, about the way it is. We have to get this much. Oh, not fighting for this much. You know, these guys fought for their, for their living and their family. And, they, and they, that's why they had so many fights. But that fight there was just 1951. You know, it's a people, young guys today probably don't know what it, what it, what it was, where it was, or who it was. Mm. <laughs> but if you know the history of boxing, it's a lot easier to find the history of boxing today than it was when I was coming up in the nineties and two thousand. You didn't have any internet, you know what I mean? It was like mm. you found out through history. You know, Muhammad Ali became the greatest of all time. There was no social media. Yeah, and he's known around. He's known around the world. Remember that? So. You know, it's amazing that there's social media today. You can become a star by just one screenshot here, bump, or a star. It just shows it goes to show that something like Muhammad Ali made an impact around the world, you know? So that's why I got to put him there. And that, but I got to put the top guy I have here, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute, my top number one. <laughs> uh, we'll, 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 we'll count down so from 10 as far as 2 before we reveal your, uh, your number 1 spot in terms of your top 10 fights so number 10 uh, we have Mickey Ward versus Arturo Gatti number 9 Buster Douglas versus Mike Tyson number 8 Diego Corrales versus Yoy Luis Castillo number 7 Riddick Bowe versus Evander Holyfield number 6 uh, Marvin Hagler versus Tommy Hearns number 5 Mike Tyson versus Trevor uh, Burbick Number four, Joe Fraser versus Muhammad Ali, the first fight. Number three is Rumble in the Jungle, Muhammad Ali versus George Foreman. Number two is the Valentine's Day Massacre, Sugar Ray Robinson versus Jake Lametta. And I suppose, Wayne uh, McCullough, for you, the, the top fight, what, has, what, has, what must it be? My top fight and my top fighter, uh, you know, I love, I say Muhammad Ali or probably the greatest of all time or Sugar Ray Robinson, but Henry Armstrong. Henry the Armstrong, I was compared to him. Eddie, Eddie compared me to him. He's from the 30s, 40s. He was um, a little small guy, but he no, perpetual motion, they called him. He was nonstop, nonstop, just like me. Had well over 100 fights. But back then, you got to remember there were eight divisions 
Mm. One world champion in each division. Henry Armstrong held three of the eight belts at one time and drew for the fourth. The guy was like 5'5", five, five, he's featherweight, you know, lightweight, welterweight, and they drew for the middleweight championship. There was no in-between weights. There was no supers and, and, and this super bantam, they're super feathers. It was all like just the featherweight, lightweight, welterweight, middleweight, heavyweight, you know, it was like that. And this guy held three, right? He held three of the four of the eight belts and drew for the fourth. He could have had half. He could have half of all the belts, and he was around the same era as Joe Lewis. So I think he was overshadowed by him. But if you want the guy right here, he was featherweight champion. In May of of, of the the following year, he jumped up the welterweight right from featherweight to welterweight. Jumps over lightweight, beats Barney Ross. He was a legend, right? He's a legend. After that, he drops back down again and wins a lightweight belt and beats Lou Ambers. That's that's how can the guys do that? But the the fight against let's say Barney Ross was unbelievable, and he jumps from featherweight to welterweight, and then drops after welterweight he drops down to lightweight. The kid is his featherweight belt, and then he he becomes lightweight and he's welterweight champion at the same time. He was featherweight, lightweight, welterweight champion at the same time for us for a second. Who does that? You know, jumps up. From nine stone to ten and a half stone, from one twenty six to one forty six, wins the belt, and then drops back down to one thirty five, nine and a half stone, and wins another belt. And I suppose Henry me, why Henry, Henry Armstrong to me is one of the greatest of in a, he's in the top five of greatest fighters of all time without a question. And to me, compared to him nonstop, I love that. We'll take that any day of the week. <laughs> and uh, Wayne, uh, that fight, uh, Henry uh, Armstrong uh, versus Barney Ross, uh, that is your number one fight, I take it. So, uh, what are your sort yeah. of how did that how did that sort of fight uh, go in terms of that sort of uh, in terms of strategy? Was it a home thing or a base for the twelve rounds? Well, he wasn't supposed to go up, go up two divisions and win. Like, Barney Ross was a legend welterweight as well. He wasn't supposed to lose, mm. but somebody like Henry Armstrong was up there, and these guys are fighting, you know. 15 rounds with no problems at all, and then they're going to do it two weeks later. They're fighting. Henry Armstrong was fighting every other week. They had the will over 100 fights, and he went up and beat Barney Ross. Good fight, but he beat him. Tough fight, but he's not expected to win. But he did it. And I say after that, he decided, I'll drop back down again. <laughs> because he's only five foot five. He was really a featherweight, and he held that division. He had the lightweight division and the welterweight division. For him to jump up to 160 pounds, 11 and a half stone. And draw, have a draw with the, the middleweight champion was like unheard of. And most people thought Henry Armstrong won the fight. So imagine having four of the eight belts at the same time. Many, many divisions is there today that I've lost count. How many divisions there is, how many champions there is. <laughs> I suppose that uh, we. I suppose, Wayne, in terms of uh, modern-day greats, you've mentioned about feet going multi-divisions to become a champion. Uh, the similarity uh, you could take today, probably Roy Jones, who did it, who became a middleweight to become a yeah. heavyweight champion. That's very... Roy, Roy, Roy was brilliant. Roy was brilliant. Roy was... He was my favourite fighter of the 90s. He was just... You know, we came along. He was in the 88 Olympics. I was in the 88 Olympics. I was a young kid. I got my medal in 82. He got a silver medal in 1988. He was raw blind, of course. But he went on to become a legend, multiple champion. And you know what? Roy, Roy could be in there too. I could, I could sit here all night and have 20. You've got to give Roy credit for one thing. If he's, he's got middleweight, light heavyweight belt, you know, junior middle, mm. and then he jumps up and fights John Ruiz at heavyweight yeah, and wins the WBA belt, who does that? Mm. Henry Armstrong does. But Roy did that. Roy did that, and Roy has to get the credit for that. I think after that fight, his body depreciated a little bit, and that's when he started getting knocked out. But to do that, to jump from from eleven stone, eleven and a half stone, one 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 fifty four, one sixty, right up to heavyweight, and he had to eat and build himself up. But he fought John Ruiz, who was a good champion, and then um, he beat him. His speed beat him. He got the speed, and he beat him. And you know what? Roy could be in here just the greatest fight. I was thinking about putting that, that fight in just because he he stepped up. And fought Ruiz, and he deserved being there. I could sit here all night, and I could probably sit here and with 99, 99, 100, but still be more. <laughs> uh, we McCullough, uh, I, couldn't, I, couldn't put, I couldn't put my own in. I couldn't put my own in either. Yeah.
Wayne McCullough, that completes uh, your top 10 fights. Just a quick recap. So at number 10, you have Mickey Ward versus Arturo Gatti. Number nine, Buster Douglas versus Mike Tyson. Number eight, De Diego Corrales versus Joyce Luis Castillo. Number seven, Riddick Bowe versus Evander Holyfield. Number six, Marvin Hagler versus Tommy Hearns. Number five, Mike Tyson versus Trevor Burbick. Number four, Joe Fraser versus Muhammad Ali. Number three, Muhammad Ali versus George Foreman. Number two, the Valentine's Day Massacre, Sugar Ray Robinson versus Jake Lametta. And your number one is Henry Armstrong versus Barney Ross. Yeah. Uh, the two are going to make it more fight. The two are going to make it more one. The four yeah. three times is two are going to make it more one. So. Yeah. Wayne, an absolute cool. pleasure uh, talking to you uh, this evening. Uh, great as always. And uh, we wish you and your family and your loved ones all the best out in Las Vegas. And hopefully we'll Thank see you, you in um, attending uh, live fights in the near future. Thanks a million, Wayne. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.